What's up, Life Point Church? How you guys doing today? Come on, what a great day to be together. It's the back end of fall break. Your kids get to go to school next week. Welcome to Life Point Church. My name is Mike. I get to serve as lead pastor. What an honor to serve you, and thank you for being here with us, especially if this is your first time here. I also, uh, I just want to look into the camera and say a big shout out to all of our locations that join us digitally or by video. We've got our online campus, which is really doing great and spreading throughout the world. And as people have moved away from here, they've stayed connected to our online campus. We want to say a big welcome to you. Also, our Austin P State University campus is going strong this week, and we're thanking God for them. They're actually, Pastor Jordan's preaching live there today, and they're just doing great. And I want to encourage you, if you're a college student or a young adult, or you just want to reach college students, we'd love for you to be a part of that campus as well. Uh, every Sunday now, one of, at least one of our camp, our services at our Ross View Road location is a video service, which last week, this service, you guys got video, and so thank you for that. Our second service got it last time uh, today. It was funny, I go out in the lobby still, and I still greet folks after every service, and I was, at, I was in the lobby once the video had started, and just kind of cruising around, just checking on stuff, you know, just looking around, and some folks walked out of the room when they saw it was video, and they saw me standing there, they're like, oh, I feel bad, you know. <laughs> I don't ever want anybody to feel judged, but really. Uh, it's it's kind of interesting as a pastor. There's like preaching four times in a row. It's, it's a lot. It's my honor to do it, but it is brutal and tiring. And uh, the last communicator people want to be live is their preacher. So just think about that for a second. Every other communicator you'll watch is on video, but most people still want their preacher to be live. So we're, we're using video at this location again and video at all of our other locations. We've got folks in Portland, Oregon who join us every week, and we want to say welcome to you guys as well as our East Valley Dream Center campus in Phoenix, Arizona. We want to say a big welcome to you guys. Come on, let's give it up for our church all around the world. I really believe the future of our church will be in multi-site and multi-locations, and uh, we're going to have to embrace video more and more as a church. It's interesting, even in the Rossview room, most of you guys are looking at screens right now, so look at you, caught you. You guys are like, what? Not me. Yes, you are. Hey, thanks for being a generous church. Uh, you guys are such a blessing, and, and it's an honor to be your pastor and to get to do for you and on your behalf some of the great things that we get to do in ministry and missions and the the giving of this church through tithes and offerings allows the day-to-day -day operations of this church to continue and thank you for that but also we get to make a difference beyond here uh, through your giving to, to missions and church planting and other organizations that we get to partner with through your giving one of the ways you get to give coming up is this weekend is our quarterly serve day on october 23rd this saturday is our serve day and we want to invite everybody to do something you we can't do everything, but everybody can do something. And I think you and your small group need to have this conversation this week. Say, what, who can we serve? What can we do to be a blessing to them? It may be a neighbor in your neighborhood. It may be a coworker at work that, that needs some help. Or, or if you want to get on our website at lifepointchurch.tv, you can join an existing um, program or an existing serve project that we have going on. It's also on our app. And we'd love for everybody to participate. In fact, if you're at our Rossview location, we have these serve shirts available for everybody. They're free for you to grab. Uh, and, and today would be a great day for you to grab them for you and your family, especially if you're planning to serve somehow this weekend. Join our website, get on our website and join an existing project. Uh, one of the cool ones that we're doing this time, we've never done it before, we're calling it our Serve Day Hero Initiative. And it's really a three-day serve project, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We're going to have um, a lot of stuff set up at the hospital here in Clarksville at both locations, uh, exit 6, I guess, and then exit 11. Uh, we're going to have food trucks, and we're going to have fun and stuff, set up, fun and things set up for them, ice cream, whatever. We've had other people want to join in on this, other companies, food companies. We had a, a masseuse call this week and said, hey, they'd like to come and just offer five-minute massages for all the doctors and nurses and medical professionals. We just want to say thank you to all the medical professionals and the EMS workers that are serving faithfully, and they are frontline workers in this last year and a half, and we just want to honor them and thank them and love them. So if you would like to join us for any of that hero initiative this weekend, we'd love for you to be a part of that. All of that's on our website, lifepointchurch.tv. And I think we can do everything, but everyone can do something. Let's go this Saturday and give some of our time and our gifts away to help others and serve them. Can I hear an amen, everyone? Amen. Jesus himself said, I didn't come here to be served, but to serve others. So I think if you want to be a little bit more like Jesus, then serve somebody. Come on. Amen. Would you hold that for me, Brother Bill? Thank you very much. All right. Hey, jump with me to Acts chapter 7. We're continuing in the book of Acts series, and uh, today's message, um, we're going to use my academic brain nerd for just a little bit, so can all the nerds just lean in and be like, oh yeah, this is going to be great? <clears throat> We've got a lot of text to get through today. Acts chapter 7 is 60 verses, and we're going to preach it all in one sermon, so I'm really excited about that today. So if you'd like to uh, turn with me to Acts 7, 
Uh, let me just kind of remind you what we've done so far through this series. We started the book of Acts on Easter Sunday. We took a little break for the parable series in the fall, but it's the beginning of the church. It's the, the, the promise that Jesus talked about all throughout his ministry. He said a day would come when the spirit would lead you and the spirit would live on the inside of you and that you would be my church. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and hell won't prevail against her. And then The church begins and miracles are happening and thousands of people are giving their lives to Jesus Christ and becoming followers of Christ that didn't know him otherwise. And this message is being preached, this gospel is being preached. And literally at every sermon, like thousands of people are getting saved. And with this massive revival that hit Jerusalem, a lot of persecution started springing up. And the pastors of this new movement are getting arrested. How many of you like your pastor to end up in jail multiple times? Yeah, okay. Seem a little indifferent, but uh, I'll work on that. Uh, right away, they're arrested multiple times for the preaching of this gospel. And they're being arrested and tried by the religious leaders of the day. And God continues to set them free. And miracles are happening. People are getting saved and healed. And uh, we've got dead folks rising from the dead. I mean, there's all kinds of amazing things happening. And then in chapters, uh, chapter 6, we have the introduction of the dream team. And that's where volunteering starts to become a normal thing in the church life. And the, the ministers had to realize their responsibilities to the preaching and the word of God and to leading the church. So they raise up volunteers, and that's where we're introduced to this man named Stephen. Stephen is a brand new character on the scene, and what they say about him, he's got good reputation, full of wisdom, full of the Spirit of God. He's also used in gifts and and, uh, wonders and acts and like miraculous things. And so Stephen is this new guy on the scene in Acts chapter 6, got an amazing reputation. Then last Sunday, I preached about when they arrested Stephen because he's a good man helping widows and full of the Spirit. So what else do you do with a guy like that but arrest him, right? I mean... Not like he's done anything bad at all. So last Sunday, I preached a message when your passion for God catches heat. And so today, we're going to continue with that. So Stephen, last week, is arrested. If you remember, he's accused of a bunch of things, and that's what happens. Uh, People are accusing him, and it says that he has a face like an angel. There's something about living at peace with God when you're in obedience to the Lord, right? And so today, we're looking at part two of his trial, his uh, accusations, and his response, and then his subsequent death by martyrdom. In fact, Stephen would become the first martyr to die for his faith in Jesus in the New Testament. And so we're going to look at his uh, death today, but really the the story that leads to his being stoned to death. Um, So last week we saw the arrest and persecution of this guy who seems to come out of nowhere, amazing testimony, full of the spirit of God, full of wisdom, grace, reputation, and then he's arrested. Today uh, we're going to hear his trial. And we're going to see the brilliance with which he talks about the story of God. Now imagine the scene that Stephen's this young man who's arrested not by the legal authorities like Rome or the police. He's arrested by church leaders. It's kind of bizarre, don't you think, how religious people have a tendency of doing that. He's falsely accused of blasphemy, blasphemy against God and against Moses and the whole way of life for the Jewish people. And he's standing alone on trial before this religious council. And the threat for him is death. And he can't wait to tell them about God's big plan. He can't wait to tell them the whole scope of God's history towards mankind and how to bring all of that story to Jesus. So I want you to walk with me through Acts chapter 7. And we're going to get through all 60 verses today. But stay with me. We're going to stay at about a 30,000 foot view for most of this, especially the first 50 verses. But I need you to just nerd out with me for a little bit. Let my degrees work for you today, okay? Okay. Um, as we get into this, I want to challenge you with a couple questions. If you were standing on trial for your faith, not for a crime you committed, but for loving God and laying hands on sick people and them having miracles and preaching the gospel, if you were standing on trial for your faith, what would you do if your passion for God actually caught heat from other people? What, how well would you stand for God when people are standing against you? And do you feel prepared well enough in your walk with God? Do you feel prepared in what you know about God? Do you feel prepared well enough to stand for your faith and to defend your faith in Jesus, even to take heat for the Lord? That's what Stephen had to do, and he models it for us. And so here's, here's how he goes through this trial. The first thing that Stephen does is he stays really focused. He keeps the main thing the main thing. He comes back to trial. Now, he's on trial for blasphemy. They said that he stirred up lies about God and about the temple. He, they said that he said, Jesus, Jesus said he's going to destroy this place and build it back in three days and change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, verse 15, chapter 6, it says, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. In chapter 7, it begins with, the high priest says to Stephen, are these things so? 
In other words, he asks, is what they're accusing you of the truth? What do you say about this? And what's, I, I love his response. Um, again, we're going to go through this all, but, but just watch how he starts. He starts by saying, brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of our, the God of glory appeared to our father, Abraham. Now, before we get into his statement, I just want you to notice how he postures himself. He starts by saying to his accusers and those that are going to kill him and the high priest, he uses family language. He says, brothers, like fathers, I'm with you. I'm one with you. We're in the same tribe. We're from the same family. We're from the same background. The God of glory appeared to our father. I love how he is taking relational language. He mentions our father. This is Stephen trying to appeal to the fact that he's one of them, that Stephen loves these people, that the very ones accusing him are people that he's actually hoping to, to, to tell this gospel to. They're friends. These are uncles and Sabbath school teachers. These were the religious leaders that taught their father and their grandfathers and, and his uncles. And he's no, Stephen is known by them and they know him and he knows them probably by name. They probably had Sabbath picnics. You know what I'm talking about? Potluck picnics with some kosher bread. And he tries to endear himself to them first relationally. Can I just pause here and encourage all of you? Whenever you're in a conversation with someone about the gospel and about Jesus, about your faith in God, if you're ever in a place where you're having to give explanation or a defense for the gospel, can we love them and treat them with dignity and respect and honor. I just want to say this for us, and, and, and I'm sure it's nothing that you've ever struggled with, but sometimes as Christians, we get so, we lose our sense of civility. We, we get so focused on trying to win an argument or win a convert that we actually lose the heart of the very person that we're trying to win to Jesus. Can we speak to them like they're our uncles and our grandfathers and, and our Sunday school teachers? Can we speak to people with the kind of affection that God was affectionate towards others? I love that he starts by using family language. He doesn't make them enemies. He doesn't make them some false accusing group of, of, of jerks. As God loved them, he loved them. And I think it would be good for us to remember, don't ever lose your Christianity trying to win people to Jesus. You're welcome. So then he goes through this massive history lesson. Now, just bear with me. It's going to take me about seven or eight minutes to get through this whole 50 verses, but I'm doing my best. And I want to encourage you to read it uh, this week and discuss the whole thing more in detail in your small group. But, but look again. He says, brothers and sisters, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran, and, and said to him, God said to Abraham, go out from your land, from your kindred, and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans. He lived in Haran. After Abraham's father died, God removed Abraham from there into this land in which you are now living. Again, he's appealing to his accusers. He goes, this very place we're living, God gave this land to Abraham, our father Abraham. And then look what he says, verse 5. Yet God gave Abraham no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length. But God promised to give it to Abraham as a possession to his offspring after him, which is Jesus. Anyway, uh, even though he had no child yet, verse six, and God spoke to this effect that Abraham's offspring, that those who followed Abraham would be sojourners in a land belonging to others who would enslave them and afflict them 400 years. God says in verse seven, he's talking about the Exodus there and the, the Egyptian captivity of Israel. But I will judge the nation that they serve, said God. And after that, they shall, here's this word that God says, about the people that would follow Abraham. They shall come out and they shall worship me in this place. And he said, this is the place we're all standing. And then he says this, and he gave Abraham the covenant. Everybody say covenant of circumcision. Now, it's brilliant how Stephen does this. He's falsely accused. He's, he's called a heretic and a blasphemer and a liar. And rather than defend any of those accusations, he says, brothers, let me remind you of God. And he starts by talking about the God of promise. You remember how God was with Abraham? Do you remember the story? And of course they knew the story. These are the scribes and the elders and the leaders of the, the Jewish traditions and the faith. 
So he starts by endearing them to their own story about God the Father, the God of promise, the God who made a promise that these people will come out and they will worship me in this place, this land that I've given to Abraham and his followers and descendants. And then God gave them, God gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. What is, what is Stephen trying to do here? He's trying to show them and remind them that we serve a God who is a promise maker. And if God's a promise maker, he is a promise keeper. He starts not by defending himself and going, no, 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 you don't understand. You didn't read my post correctly. You didn't hear what I tweeted. You didn't hear what I was blaspheming. He goes, hey, you can accuse me of whatever you want. Let me talk to you about God. When his life is on the line, he puts God on full display. I think it's brilliant. Then he moves on from there, by the way. He continues. He starts with the God of promise. Start, go with me to verse 9. And then he starts jumping over after Abraham was Isaac, and then Isaac was Jacob, and then Jacob and the 12 patriarchs, verse 8. Verse 9 says, and the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. Now, the patriarchs of Joseph, of, of, the patriarchs of the Jewish tradition were the 12 tribes that were the older brothers of Joseph that they would become the 12 tribes of Israel. These patriarchs sold their baby brother Joseph into slavery into Egypt. Come on, you guys have watched the Prince of Egypt, right? But God with him, was with him and rescued Joseph out of all of his affliction and gave Joseph favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all of his household. So, so the brothers sell the guy into slavery, but God has a different plan. And he's telling the story like these guys had never heard it before, but he's bringing context to bear. Now watch this, verse 11. Now there came a famine throughout, of all, throughout all of Egypt and Canaan and great affliction and others, uh, other, our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers to their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became now known to Pharaoh. So Joseph, sold into slavery, now has great favor with Pharaoh and brings the whole family of the patriarchs, including Isaac, in front of Pharaoh. What's he telling us here? That we serve a God of provision. He starts telling them the story of Joseph to remind them that in lean times and bad times, in good times and in hard times, we serve a God who provides. When Joseph was sold into slavery, God used it to promote him in Pharaoh's house. And then when a famine came upon the land, God used Joseph to bring grain and to bring the families of our, of our family, Abraham, back to have provision. We serve a God who provides. He brings up this story of, of Joseph and how the story of God's provision was good to God's people, even through terrible things like being sold into slavery by his own brothers, God used it. So he's talked about God our provider, excuse me, God our promise maker, and now God our provider. Stay with me, y'all tracking so far? Then he moves on to this massive narrative about Moses. And the reason he spends so much time on Moses is because they accused him of blasphemy against the law of Moses. So then he goes in verse 17. Then at the time of the promise, as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham that they would have this land and they would live in it, the people of Israel increased in number and multiplied. Now they're in Egypt under Pharaoh. They increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king, another Pharaoh who didn't know Joseph. And that's when Egypt enslaved the Israelites, right? You guys read your Bible in the Old Testament. He dealt shrewdly with our race. He forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would be not kept alive or killed. At this time, Moses was born and he was beautiful in God's sight. And he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And he was mighty in his words and deeds. When Moses was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit the Israelites, the children of Israel, his brothers. And seeing one of them being wronged by an Egyptian, he defended the oppressed man, avenged him, and killed the Egyptian that was hurting him. You guys have heard these stories before. Why is Stephen telling this Old Testament story? Watch. Jump over with me to verse 29. They said, who do you think you are? Who made you judge and ruler at us? Verse 29, at this retort, that's a word we should bring back, by the way, retort. Moses fled and became an exile out of Egypt into the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now, 40 years later, he's now 80 years old. An angel appeared to Moses in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of fire in a bush. You guys know the story of the bush on fire, right? And when Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight, and he drew near to look, and there, as he drew near to look, there came the voice of the Lord. Here's Stephen giving his defense of, is he a blasphemer? And here's what he's telling him. And he says where the Lord said in verse 32, I am the God of your fathers. 
The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses trembled and didn't dare look. And the Lord said to Moses, take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. And then God says this, look what God says to Moses. I have, God says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in bondage in Egypt, and I've heard their groaning, and I will come down and deliver them. God says, I myself will come down and deliver them, and now come, and I will send you to Egypt. What is Stephen doing? Are you a blasphemer? Are you stirring up dissensions? Are you lying about God and about Moses? And Stephen responds with the story of God, our promise maker under Abraham, God, our provider under Joseph, and now God, our deliverer under Moses. He's telling a totally different story. He's not defending himself at all, by the way. Can I just point that out? He's lifting up the name of God. He's saying, this is God who delivered then, and he's God who delivers now. Look what God says, I've heard the affliction of my people. I will come down. And he's making a shift towards Jesus. He's trying to help these people realize that the same God who made promises, who made provision, and who made deliverance is the God who's doing all of this through Stephen and the apostles today. The same God who set them free from a literal physical slavery bondage in Egypt is the God who's setting free these demoniacs and these people who are getting um, bound by sin and sickness in the days that Stephen is preaching the gospel. He's making the point that the God of their ancestors, our ancestors, is the God who's doing a new thing today. And then he makes this really interesting shift. If you're reading through this too fast, you might miss it. Verse 35, Moses, whom they rejected, said, who made you ruler and judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in a bush. This man led them out of Egypt, he's saying, performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea in the wilderness for 40 more years. Look at verse 37. This is the same Moses who said to the Israelites, and he's quoting a verse that they all knew. This is the same Moses who said, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your own brothers. What kind of prophet was Moses? He was bold, he was prophetic, he spoke to power, he had the word of God on his mouth. Who does that sound like? Jesus. So Stephen is not defending himself at all. He's using the story they all knew of the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, and Joseph, the God of Moses, and then Moses saying, I'm gonna raise up somebody better than me. And he's making this turn now to turn their attention to Jesus. Are y'all seeing this so far? It's reminding them that God is a God who saves and promises and delivers and stays true to his word. And he's making this shift to tell the crowd of religious leaders who want him dead that God is still delivering people and still saving people. And there's one coming, one that they know in this, in, from this verse that is talking about Jesus, this prophet like Moses. Then he makes another shift and he shifts their attention again to go from Abraham and Joseph and Moses to now the father of their nation, which is David, the king. And they knew that Messiah would come from the lineage of King David. They knew that. It was prophetic. It was prophesied. Look what happens in verse 44. Our fathers had a tent of witness in the wilderness. I mean, he's just telling the whole Bible in his defense. They're like, we're going to kill you. He's like, well, let me tell you my whole Sunday school lesson first. He said, our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses, God directed him to make it, according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers, in turn, brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. Look at here. So it was until the days of David, who found favor in the sight of God. Now, what was the tent that he's talking about? He's talking about the the, the tabernacle that they would set up. It was the first mobile church, by the way, set up, tear down church. It was the tabernacle in the wilderness, and that's where the Holy of Holies was in the Ark of the Covenant. And that's where God's presence would meet the priests and the leaders of Israel. So Stephen is telling this amazing story about all of these days, and it's all coming, and then they're in the wilderness, and they set up the tabernacle, and so it was until the days of David. They had this set up, tear down tabernacle until the days of David, who found favor in the sight of God, and God asked to find a dwelling place David, rather, asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob, but it was Solomon who actually built a house for him. Why does God need a house? Because God is the God of presence, and he's reminding his accusers of the God that they say they serve. They're asking him, are you blaspheming? Are you stirring up lies? Are you, are you blaspheming against Moses and God? And he goes, let me remind you of the God we say we serve. 
We serve a God who's a promise maker. We serve a God who's a provider and a deliverer. And we serve a God who has shown time and time again that he wants to be with us. He wanted to be with us in the Garden of Eden. He wanted to be with us in the tabernacle. He wanted to be with us in the wilderness. He was a God. And and once David came along, God gave David and then Solomon favor to build a house where God can come and be with us. And he's telling them the story they knew very well, but he puts it in a new context and he frames it in a new way to bring light to Jesus. Look Look at the four things he tells them. Just go through verses one through 50. He said, we've got the God of promise through the story of Abraham. We have the God of provision through the story of Joseph, the God of deliverance through the story of Moses, and the God of presence that we've seen through the story of the temple and the establishment of Tabernacle Temple than David and Solomon. Who fulfills all of these things? Think of who Stephen's being accused of serving. Who's he being accused of following? Jesus. Well, Jesus is the fulfillment of all of God's promises. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of God's provision. All of heaven now belongs to us because Jesus himself, God the Son, came to be our ultimate source of provision. Everything that God has for us, he's given us through Christ. He is the ultimate deliverer. If you want to be set free from sin and death and bondage to those things, you got to be set free in Jesus. He's making the case that the whole story you guys know is actually all about this man, Jesus, that you're now holding me on trial for following, but actually he came to fulfill all these things. It's not about Abraham. It's about Jesus. It's not about Joseph. It's about Jesus. It's not about Moses. It's about Jesus. And it's not about a temple building. It's about Jesus on the inside of us. He makes the most brilliant case for Jesus from the Old Testament. Let me just tell all of you that think the Old Testament's dead and invaluable. It all points to Jesus. We need those stories because they fuel us to remember the big story of what God has been doing throughout mankind's history is making a way for Christ to come so that we can have intimacy, so that we can have promise and provision and deliverance and the presence of God again. Man, Stephen is brilliant. He puts together like he has no New Testament to preach from. He only had the old covenant that they knew very well, and they're holding him accountable, saying, we're going to stone you to death for blaspheming against God. He goes, no, 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 I'm lifting up the story of God. We're going to stone you to death for blaspheming against Moses. No, no, Moses said this would happen. What an amazing God, consistent God, brilliant preaching. By the way, we just got through 50 verses in about nine minutes. Come on to the glory of Jesus. We did it, y'all. That's the biggest, like this is one of the longest passages I've ever had to preach in one sermon. He lays this out by teaching them that this is what God's been up to all along. Now watch this. Why did he do it this way? Why didn't he just defend what he was saying? Well, I healed that lady because she was sick. Well, I took care of those widows because they didn't have any. Why didn't he just defend himself? Notice Stephen never defends himself. Did you notice that? He not one time says, well, the reason I was preaching this gospel, well, you know, I was out on the side street and somebody came to me and said, what do you believe about Jesus? So I had to preach. He never defended himself one time. He never actually gave an account for himself once. And they're accusing him on his own and making him stand trial on his own for things that he did. And he chose rather to make much of what God did instead of try to defend what he did. Man, that is so brilliant. And I'm telling you, in the day that we live right now, we're the most defensive. We're the most like alarmingly defensive people I've ever seen in my 41 years of living. Like we always want to throw stuff out and then defend it. And you better believe what I believe. You better think what I think or I will cancel you. I'll cut you. I'll shame you. I'll shun you. Stephen never made a case for himself, but he made a huge case for God. It's worth noting under pressure and being grilled for his faith. He didn't defend his social positions. He didn't defend his politics. He didn't defend his own rights to believe what he wants or to live how he wants or to love who he wants. He didn't make a defense about himself at all. Can I encourage you, church? In the most defensive days that we live in, lift up the name of Jesus. Let your defense be an an apologetic for the gospel. Can we stop defending our own self, our own power struggles? People today are, 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 are in desperate need of the gospel. 
And Christians today are desperately in need, are, are interested in defending themselves and their passions and positions and their belief on Calvinism and Arminianism and, and their rights and their romances, their belief of God and country and medicine and social issues. Stephen only talked about God. He never talked about himself. He only talked about God. He kept the main thing, the main thing. I don't know about you, but if I was going to be stoned to death for preaching this gospel, I'd be like, well, can I, can, I, can I say my, can I give my thoughts about me? Like, can I just tell you why I did it, you know? Stephen, like, he is so impressive. He's so impressive. He's full of the Spirit. He's full of wisdom. He's full of the glory of God. He's full of the power of God, signs and wonders. And when the heat was on, he stayed true to pushing into Jesus. And then, it's interesting, he makes a shift. He tells them to reject this story that you guys have been preaching. You guys have had it in your Bibles for centuries, basically is what he's saying. This story of Abraham, Joseph, Moses, and David in the temple, he's like, you guys have known this forever. And then what he tells them next is if you reject this story, you're rejecting the God you say you've been serving. If you reject this Jesus, you're rejecting the very God that you've been saying you're believing in all these years. Watch how he shifts. He goes, you stiff-necked people. Man, I get it as a pastor. There are moments where I just want to encourage people to loosen up and like be flexible. He says, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears. You know when they heard, you're uncircumcised. They're going, no, 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 not me. I got my card. I'm sorry, that's too soon. My bad. <laughs> I got a couple viral videos of me making circumcision jokes. But anyway, please don't hate on me. I don't want to get in a fight with you over this. It's just in the Bible. Okay, uncircumcised in heart. Here's what he's actually saying. You may be physically circumcised, but God, you've not let God cut your heart at all. You might have the physical, religious, outward appearance of circumcision, but God doesn't have the right to change anything about what you think or believe. You stiff-necked, stubborn, unchangeable people. And look what he says here. Now he's going in on this trial. You have always resisted the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did. Notice they were our fathers. But Stephen hasn't resisted the Holy Spirit. So that's no longer his pattern. He says, just as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? Go back and read about them. Samuel, Isaiah, <laughs> Jeremiah, Micah. They all got persecuted by the very religious people that they were sent to help pro prophesy to. He goes, they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous. When he's talking about John the Baptist here who said... Prepare the way in the wilderness. He's in the wilderness. going to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. And they beheaded that guy. The righteous one, now Jesus, whom you have now betrayed and murdered also. You guys killed the prophets. You killed the guys talking about Jesus. Then you murdered Jesus. Stiff-necked, uncircumcised, unchangeable, stubborn people. And you're going to put me on trial? He said, you who received the law as delivered by angels, yet yourselves didn't even keep it. Woo, my man is going for it. You know why? What's he got to lose? He's standing on trial for the God of glory. He's not defending himself. He's trying to tell them, you've always done this to God. You've always made it about you and not him. You, you would rather be right than righteous, and you've done it forever. And you're doing it now. You want to murder me for healing people and taking care of widows and being full of the spirit and preaching the gospel? Are you kidding me? You've always been this way. And you who say you've been given the law by the angels. Man, this is, this is the fight. This is the fight of spiritual warfare that's been going on. Like the fight to be religious versus to be in relationship with God. To be right or to be righteous. And Stephen let him have it, man. And he's saying, if you reject this thing that God's been trying to do, if you're rejecting Jesus now, you already had him murdered. But if you reject him, he's still living and he's still available. And if you keep rejecting him, you're rejecting the God you've been saying you've been following the whole time. Whoo. Man. Stephen calls him out for always resisting the Holy Spirit. It's been their pattern for generations. Just because God's doing something different doesn't mean God's doing something wrong. I love that verse. You'll have to... Google it on your own. It says, behold, the Lord says, I'm doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? I love to say the God who never changes is always up to something new. 
That's why we're embracing video. You know why? Because it's a new way to get the gospel out. That's why we're going to continue to take ground for the kingdom and start new campuses and do new things for the gospel. You know why we're going to serve people at the hospital? You know why? Because God's always wanted to do new things that we can reach people far from God. And just because it's a new thing and a different thing doesn't make it a wrong thing. And they'd rather stone a guy for doing a new thing in the name of God than let God do something new. Man, they would rather reject God than embrace what God is doing through Christ. And this is not just rejecting a new speaker, it's rejecting the spirit. And man, to, do, to reject Christ is to reject God. There is no way to God except through Jesus. I hate to tell you this, I didn't write the Bible, I'm just telling you what it says. There's no other way to God but through Jesus Christ. If you say, I'm gonna get to God by my good works or through Buddha or Muhammad or Allah, you ain't gonna make it. There's no other way to God but through Jesus. That's just the truth. And you can stone me to death if you want because I'm going to be with Jesus when you kill me. So it don't bother me at all. But there's no other way to God but through Christ. And God, this is the way that he said it from the beginning. He promised deliverance through Moses. He promised provision in the story of Joseph. He said that through the offspring, these people, I will be in relationship with you and that, and that we're gonna have intimacy with God. He's been promising this for centuries and it all comes ahead through Jesus. And if you reject that story, if you wanna try to get to God, but uh, aside from Jesus, if you wanna cancel the church and cancel Jesus because you're mad at some of his followers, you will not make it to God without Jesus. And that's what they're trying to do here, is pressure him and persecute him and cancel him. That's what happens in our world still. I mean, if those present with Jesus, they walked with Jesus, they knew him, still crucified him. How many of you know people in this world today will keep doing it? I was in a missions meeting this week that, on a board that I serve, and we are finding that actual, like, devoted relationship to Jesus Christ, the world population, not like they check a box of religious affiliation, but, like, devoted to Christ, it's under 10% of the world's population. That means a lot of the world has rejected Jesus. It means we got a lot of work to do. We're gonna keep preaching. We're gonna stay confident. We're gonna stop fighting over dumb stuff and we're gonna preach the gospel. Quit fighting over what color the drapes are in the church building, who cares? And let's preach the gospel. Can I hear an amen? So we went from this high view of the scripture of the whole Testament, the whole Old Testament. And he tells them like, you gotta change. You gotta turn your heart to God. And then he ends up dying for it. And I just have this question as we end the sermon. Are you willing to be a true witness for Jesus? The word witness and martyr are the same word. Martyr in the Greek is the word that we translate into witness. When you, be, when you bear witness for something, you, you die to you to make big of that thing, right? So if you're a huge fan of a sports team, if you're a huge fan of a political party, if you're a huge fan of an ideology, you'll die to you in order to make that thing platformed bigger. The question is, will you be a witness for the Lord. You would think after he said all these things, you stiff-necked, uncircumcised of heart, stubborn people, you've always done this. I'm telling you to turn to God. You'd think they'd go, oh, yes, bring out the keyboards. We're ready, Stephen. Oh. And when they heard it, verse 54, they ground their teeth at him. They were so angry. I mean, that's incredibly mad that they ground their teeth at him. Man, this is terrible and it's sad to me, but it's still the reaction of so many in our world who need Jesus, that they would be enraged at Christ and his people. I was reading this week about the overwhelming amount of persecution towards the Christians in the world, and we know about it in the Middle East, we know about it in the uh, underdeveloped parts of the world, especially nations that are uh, led by a dogma or a religion where they outright persecute Christians. But I'm talking in like free country kind of parts of the world, Western developed world, Canada. I mean, it's happening throughout the U.S. and major cities on the shores in, in particular. But in Canada, recently, a pastor was arrested in front of his own family for holding services during the pandemic. In Australia, the, the persecution against the church and, and Christianity. But in Canada, there are laws being written to persecute Christians. In fact, you can Google this, the criminalization of Christianity in Canada, and there's a whole bunch of articles about it, that, that Christianity would be criminalized in certain parts of our world. And let me just tell you, just because haters hate, we're not going to stop living for Jesus boldly. I'm not ever going to say no to Jesus. Throw stones in my face if you want. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Matrix Neo. I'm out. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to... You ain't going to catch me slipping. <laughs> but haters have always hated, and they're going to keep hating. And we're going to live boldly for Jesus. 
But I ask you this question, who will be a witness for the Lord? Stephen preaches this word boldly. And when they heard it, they were enraged and ground. They were so, he was absolutely right when you said you stiff-necked, stubborn, unchangeable people. And when they heard that, they're like, we're never going to change. And they grind their teeth at him. But look at this in verse 55. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit. I love that God gifted more of himself to Stephen here. <laughs> Are you seeing this? Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit. Look at this. He gazed into heaven and he saw the glory of God. There are very few times in the scripture where we see God have these like open heaven moments with someone. I mean, he did with Jesus, obviously, twice. Philip has this weird heaven encounter. Uh, Elijah. But here's Stephen, about, like on trial. And it says that he gazes into heaven and he sees the glory of God. And look at this. And he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Okay. Luke repeats it. And he said, Stephen said, behold, I, I mean, he just got done preaching. You stiff-necked, unchangeable. And then he goes, behold, I see the heavens open right now. And the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And you would think they would look around and go, where, where, where can we see? Do we see that too? And instead, it says they got so mad, they cried out with a loud voice and they stopped their ears, la, 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 and they rushed at him. They cast him out of the city and they stoned him to death. You know what strikes me about this text? And you probably never noticed it before if you've read this before. It's that Jesus was standing at the right hand of the Father. See, all throughout the New Testament, we have this imagery of Jesus sitting at the right hand of God, that he sits. Hebrews says he sits at the right hand of the Father, praying for us and interceding for us. But for some reason that day, because of how bold Stephen was, Jesus himself stands to watch. That's my boy. You don't back down, Stephen. You keep going. You keep standing there. Come on. Get on your feet, he says. Come on. All the heaven stands with Jesus at the right hand of the Father. Going, That's what I'm talking about right there. You know what Jesus could have done is rescued him out of there. He could have snatched him out. He could have sent a legion of armies of God's angels. But he didn't. Jesus rather stood in confidence for his boy. And then he gifted him this vision of you're coming right here. Don't worry about all of that. And man, there's something about Stephen. I don't know that I can make a theology for this, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you'll stand for God, I believe God will stand for you. I think if you'll be proud of your walk with God, if you'll be bold in your devotion to Jesus, he'll be bold in his devotion to you. That's what Jesus actually said. If you're ashamed of me before others, I'll be ashamed of you before the fathers. If you're proud of me before others, I'll be proud of you before the Father. And here we see Jesus himself standing at the right hand of God because of Stephen's actions. He was so confident in the Bible story and what God was trying to do, and he was so confident to call out that rebellious heart in those Jewish leaders, and God's like, come on, boy, you're coming home to me now. And then look what it says. As they were stoning him to death, he calls out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Not a rock hurt that guy. Are you kidding me? He's getting plummeted, pummeled in the face with these rocks. Boom, boom. Falling on his knees, he cries out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. That's a guy who's met with Jesus. To be able to pray, don't hold this against them, God. Keep going after them, God. Keep your mercy. Lord, keep forgiving them. Oh, Lord, God, receive my spirit. Oh. And literally doesn't even say he died because death didn't take Stephen out. He fell asleep and he arrived into the heavens with Jesus. You can't take a guy out like that who's just so confident in the God of this story, the God of Abraham, the God of Joseph, the God of Moses, the God of David, the God of Jesus, the God who's with us still delivering, setting us free. And man, I'm telling you, he not only died in the flesh, but he died for to the flesh for Jesus. He laid it all down. He didn't get soft and weak at the time of pressure. He went in to the things of God. He died to his flesh, still asking that they be forgiven. That's a real encounter with God to be able to do that. So I asked you when you started, what would you do 
when your passion for God catches heat from other people. You think being unliked or unfollowed on social media is pain? Give me a break. How well would you stand for God when others are standing against you? And then I ask you, do you feel well prepared enough to not only take a stand for your faith, to defend your faith, but to take heat for your faith? Do we trust that God's a promise maker, that God's a provider and a deliverer? And do we trust that he's present with us? What if we live so passionately for God? Man, it didn't matter to us if we died for God. What if we talked so profoundly about the Lord that it moved others to move closer to God? Will we let our lives be on display as a witness for the Lord Jesus? I don't want to want to die physically, you know what I'm saying? Like I got kids to raise, I got a church to pastor. I got marathons to talk about. I ain't gonna run one, are you joking? If you're a marathoner, God bless you, don't email me. I'm just saying I don't wanna die in the flesh, but I would. But I can die in so many other ways. I can give up my Saturday. I can give up 10% of my income. I can give up my Thursday for my small group. I can die to my social media not being about the latest political trend and who said what about vaccines and I can let everything that I put out be about Jesus. I can die to so many things in this world on my way to ultimately dying from this world. Will you be a witness for the Lord? Father, in Jesus' name, God, would you move in our hearts like you moved in the heart of Stephen? Would you draw us close to you? Would you make us more like you, God? Would you transform us like you did Stephen, God? I don't know where this guy came from. I don't know who raised him. I don't know what schools he went to. But Lord, his passion for God fires me up. So Lord, would you put that in us today? Lord, would you call us to a deep devotion to your word and the story of God's plan in our lives? God, would you draw us in to be people who are confident in you, bold as a lion, willing to stand up for God no matter what. Lord, would we stop fighting over Babylon and just stuff that doesn't matter forever? Would you give us a confidence to stand for God, to see the big picture of what you're doing? Go all in, Lord God, that we die to the things of this world so that we can live for you forever in Jesus' name. Would you pray this with me? Come on, pray it and mean it. If you believe in Jesus, Come on, say it. Say, God, I believe in Jesus, that he died for my sin as my deliverer, as my provider, as my covenant-keeping, promise-making, present God. Say, I believe in Jesus, that he died for me so that I can live for him. Forgive me for my sin. I will live for you for the rest of my life in Jesus' name. I say this and mean it. Come on boldly around the room and online. Say, God, I'm all in. Say, to the glory of God, I'm all yours. I'm all in forever in Jesus' name. Come on, can we give the Lord praise and honor today in Jesus' name. Praise you, God.